Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for having us. I, I introduced myself, but again, Michael Goldberg. I'm the executive director with Heartland Housing. And I'm sorry, we didn't, I didn't introduce myself. Um, but Michael Goldberg, executive director of Heartland Housing. Um, with me is Candace McCoy Cunningham, who is our director of real estate development. Um, and I was told about 10 minutes or so just to give, um, well, uh, my thought was to give a little overview, if that's okay. Yeah? Okay, great. It's my presentation. Okay, well, I don't want to talk about the football game, so let's talk about this. <laughs> um, so again, it's great to be here. A um, little bit about Heartland Housing. Some of you may have this information. I know Kathy is familiar with our organization a little bit, but for others, uh, we're a um, affordable housing development uh, organization based out of Chicago. Um, uh, but we do work uh, throughout Wisconsin and then uh, in the Chicago area as well. Uh, and we're only affordable housing developers. We're organized as a not-for-profit, um, so we're mission-based. Um, and really our mission has been to serve the most vulnerable uh, and marginalized within our communities. Um, and right now we work uh, predominantly in uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, and, and then Madison. Um, and we're, we're part of a much bigger organization called uh, Heartland Alliance. And within that company, uh, or umbrella of companies, if you will, we, we really try and address all the conditions that lead people uh, to, and communities to be marginalized or vulnerable. And so we have a group that works on healthcare. Uh, we have a group that works on social services in all areas of social services. We have an organization that does international work. And again, it's all with this lens of trying to help marginalized, underserved communities and people um, really achieve all that they can um, within their lives and working with them. And my group is the housing group. So how we got here. Um, so as you know, I, I assume you know that we were the developers and now the operators or property managers of uh, two permanent supportive housing developments uh, in Madison. Uh, that have been built and are operational. So first, the Rescue Terrace Apartments um, on Rescue Terrace um, on the east side. And then more recently, uh, the Tree Lane Apartments uh, on the west side. And so we got there through the city's RFQ process, where the city selected us uh, and our service partners for each of those developments as part of the the mayor's or citywide uh, initiative to end homelessness in Madison. Um, working closely with other partners, including the county. And so it was through that process that we were selected, and uh, we were selected, again, with our partners in place that do the services. So as an organization, uh, Heartland Housing provides the development expertise and the ownership and management, but then we always partner with uh, another organization that's more, um, uh, has more their mission, the service component. And so we always do that kind of partnership. So just as a philosophy, um, we consider ourselves a human rights organization. And that's really the lens that we view our work. We consider ourselves human rights workers and that you know, it really um, sort of helps shape, helps shape the way we think about uh, the work that we do. Um, we're very much focused in our housing for this population and um, these kind of populations as harm reduction. So it's about reducing those negative consequences um, to drug use or substance use and for both of these projects that are operational, so we were, we were asked to serve chronically homeless individuals with Rescue Terrace, so those are studio units, uh, and then chronically homeless families with tree lane apartments. Um, and so for both of those, the idea is, and the philosophy is, uh, this national philosophy of housing first. And the idea of, you know, for someone that's been struggling with housing stability, and um, many of the barriers that they've had to you know, achieving all that they can be, um, uh, that the, the best thing that we can do immediately is put them in housing. Get them stability, get them housed, get them connected with services, which is a key component of housing first model, and then they can start to work on those issues uh, collectively with us and our partners to, um, to improve their outcomes, to achieve a higher quality of to really achieve what they want to achieve. Um, it's a lot about them telling us you know, where they would like to go uh, with this housing as their platform. 
So we approach uh, our work with that housing first uh, philosophy. And then just a little bit, you know, I mentioned uh, Refki. I won't focus too much on that, but I'm ha we're, we're happy to answer questions about Refki Terrace as well. I mentioned that that population is a little different, that it's individuals. But tree lane apartments, so um, it was built with uh, 45 units. I think we have two, three, and four bedroom units uh, in the building. So again, it, it was really uh, geared toward, toward families. Um, and so uh, 45 units, um, we, the information that we were provided is that, so we're selecting from the, we're selecting, we're interviewing uh, potential residents and the original residents that were moved in came off the city's coordinated entry uh, list. And so we started at the top and worked our way down and uh, we were told that the average length of stay for the folks that, that we've moved in to our into tree lane apartments, the average length of stay in the homeless system in Madison is around four years. And so these are people that have really been struggling with housing stability um, and those those issues. And you know, if we think about it, it's with families, so we have, we have kids, we have in fact, in our 45 units, we have over 100 children, uh, minor age children uh, living in the building uh, as well. Sorry, just really quick clarification, that's okay. Um, the four years average is for families or for combined? Families. Families, yeah, okay, thank you. So, you know, so, uh, Again, that service partnership, which is so critical uh, to the success of our of our um, of our residents, <clears throat> for this development, we um, we applied through the RFQ process with the YWCA of Madison, um, and they've been our service partner this whole time. And you know, for the for the first, so we've been in operations. Uh, we we started taking we started moving in residents at the end of June 2018. So we're about we're about seven months into um, into the operations of the building. And so um, if you think about the challenges that the families we've been housing have come to this building with, it, it's been a lot of survival skills. It's been a lot of, um, you know, going from shelter or place not meant for habitation, um, kids moving out of schools. It's, it's just been a lot of instability and a lot of survival instincts and skills. And so. The services are really focused, uh, I think, a lot on that housing stability piece for this first sort of uh, move-in period. A lot of crisis intervention, um, making rent. So even though we have, so uh, the building has, uh, all units are covered by a project-based uh, rental subsidy. And so residents pay no more than 30% of their income toward rent, uh, all residents. Um, and that's also a part of you know, the affordability, obviously, uh, strategy here. Um, and, uh, and yet, so when the payment is small, we still have folks that are struggling with making that payment. And so the Y has been focused on how they can help people make rent, conflict resolution, you know, moving again from a shelter or you know, other circumstances to having neighbors. Um, and living peacefully with your neighbors has been a, a big part of the crisis stability, the crisis intervention uh, work. Um, but, you know, we've had, while well, we certainly have had our challenges there, uh, we've also had successes. And so, again, you know, in the Housing First model, housing people is a success. And we, um, uh, except for some recent transitions of families out of the building, you know, we've been able to keep people housed for seven months. Uh, most people, uh, the original, uh, the original residents of the building, successfully housed for nearly seven months now. And we've had kids going to school, and you know, the opportunity for the children in our building to stay at that same school. And if you read the literature right now, there's just so much made about how moving a child, um, especially uh, you know, the children in circumstances like we're housing, how that moved to a new school because you know, the mom or dad couldn't make rent on that uh, apartment they were renting, or they moved to a shelter because something happened. That move sets them back so far, and now the, those kids have that stability that they can stay at this building. It's affordable. Um, uh, kids have, are in school. They can uh, have that opportunity that access to services. So again, a key tenant of 
Housing First philosophy is that those services are voluntary, but you know we uh, on the management side and the service side um, try and do what we can when a resident isn't engaging in services to encourage them to uh, act, to actively engage in those services. So the services are there, um, and it's working uh, with them to take advantage of those, and just some great you know beyond that some outcomes like. We know a handful of our residents have, um, if you know where the, the building is on Tree Lane, just north of Midland Point Road, there's a lot of commercial around us, and which is great uh, for our residents in terms of shopping, but also in terms of jobs. And we know a number of our residents have already secured employment um, uh, within walking distance. And so, great outcome. Um, and, um, well, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll maybe stop there. I'm probably around that 10 minute mark. And so um, I would just say, you know, we've been, we've been welcomed into both communities. Again, we've had our challenges, but we've also just uh, seen um, an outpouring of support from uh, our neighbors and, uh, at both sides, really. Um, most recently at Tree Lane, a lot of engagement uh, with our neighbors that have come into the building and want to come into the building more. Um, both from the school and help connect kids and parents more to the school system and the opportunities there. We had some neighbors uh, organize a couple pizza parties and you know just as a way of helping uh, our neighbor our, our, our residents you know get comfortable in the neighborhood, get to know some familiar faces, make friends, that kind of thing. So that's starting to happen. It takes it takes a while, um, but that those kind of community connections are starting to happen, and we think that's a really good thing. So, um, you know, with that, uh, maybe I'll I'll stop there. Any questions? <laughs> no, no, I I want someone else to kick this off. Well, so, Lynette, were you going to say anything, or is that, no, I'm just getting my chin. Okay. Um, so, I know the city recently, because, of, so there's some neighbors who are really happy that Tree Lane is, is, is people there, and, and, but then there have been some neighbors I know that have been less than thrilled. Um, that happens. Uh, and I know that the city recently put in, it was 160,000, is that correct? 165,000. Pardon? 165,000. 165,000 into additional security. So, um, it's one question, I, I guess one question I have um, for you is, do you feel that um, in terms of budget, there was sufficient funding for the service side of the development? Um, or could that 165,000 have been used to enhance services in a way that would have had the end result of reducing some of the behavioral issues some of the neighbors had? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I, I think I understand what you're saying. You know, so um, I'll answer it a couple different ways. Um, Are you an attorney? I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Um, so here's a, I would say one thing, a anyone that works in permanent supportive housing, anyone that operates it, we, we would take, uh, collectively we would take more uh, funding for supportive services anytime it's offered, right? I mean, the, the richer the service program, um, uh, the better the outcomes for our participants, more opportunities they have. I mean, all those things are great. And so, um, you know, there's a limit to funding, but the more generally, I would say, the, the better. Um, so I would answer it that way. But I would, I would also say, so this, so we got, we've been, I'm sorry, I didn't give this context. So we, we've been doing this kind of housing for 30 years now. Um, and uh, we serve chronically homeless individuals and families in other developments that, that we own and operate. And so permanent support of housing, so that idea of housing plus services. And, you know, while we have some developments that have uh, higher uh, service budgets, we have others that have lower service budgets as well. And so, um, you know, sometimes you just have to tailor it to who you're housing at that, at that time. 
So we came in, we came in with the Y, and we have an amount uh, for services. Um, and some of it is generated um, through the operations of the building, and we have grants um, through the, you know, again, the partnership and generosity of the city, and um, some other funders uh, for the balance. And so when we were coming in, you know, I think we all felt like we still needed to do more. Like it would be sufficient to begin and let's see how things go. But we were always engaging in additional fundraising. So we have been active since, well, since before opening, on trying to secure additional funding for services. And, um, you know, I think uh, our experience has been given Given some of the, the issues our families are dealing with right now, we, we could use additional money for services. Um, I, think, I think that's very apparent um, that what our current funding is, is probably not meeting the needs of every resident. I will say also, and Candace can jump in here too, it is serving the needs of many of our residents. And so some of the things, some of the things you're going, you, you, that you have read about uh, or heard about, it, it's, some of those extreme examples are, are really limited to a handful of our families. Um, many of our families, uh, you know, in fact, you know, I will hear from Candace or our, our property management team that we don't see them. Like, you know, they go about their business, they're going to school, they're going to work, or, you know, they're doing what they're doing and we don't see them and we don't have those kinds of challenges. Um, they may, may still have those needs, um, but they're not presenting the same way that you know, some of the things that have be, become a little bit more public have been. I also want to add that um, when you open up a new building or a new supportive housing building, you do go through a stabilization period. And so it's not ideal to have a lot of money or resources devoted to security. But at the very beginning, it's a necessity, not for the residents that's living there, but actually for individuals that kind of try to prey on residents that have found permanent housing. And so, um, the mindset is that if you can get the building stable, and then you can actually lower that cost um, in the future once you get that building stable, and um, um, and then everyone knows that it's a safe space for everyone. Um, the security in the building that we're asking for is not really for the it's for the residents' protection, and it's just to keep um, people out that are constantly trying to prey on our residents that are living there. I just want to add some clarification. There is one resolution that was entered for the 165 for security. Um, there is another resolution that will now follow that is about the support services. So as Michael said, we had a support services plan from the Y of how many staff were adequate. Um, we were working on fundraising opportunities to make sure that was adequately staffed. Um, now that we've been open for six months, we're taking another look at that as the city and seeing where else we can um, kind of increase additional support services beyond that um, initial support service plan. Um, through six months, the Y has been able to give us a lot of detail of additional service needs that even they kind of didn't outline in that first plan that we hope will help stabilize that building. And the security then is not a long-term Plan. It is during the stabilization period, as Candace just said, to kind of help us with that front door access. And as we get more um, of the case management staff to be there, to be there extended hours besides just an eight to five um, kind of period, it offers that um, support to the residents that we wouldn't need the security or front desk access. Lynette, the second resolution, how much is that? We're working on those details right now. Um, we've introduced it, um, we're going to be introducing it by title only. Um, and um, it will go to our finance committee February 11th, um, and then go to our common council then at the February 22nd. Um, but we are looking at a substantial increase in support services um, with that request. We're really trying to make sure it's the correct dollar amount, not just for 2019 services, but ongoing services. Um, and um, a little bit of clarification of why we don't have the exact dollar amount is um, we're also trying to look at this as creating a, I'm calling it a housing stabilization team approach. So it's not just about um, you know getting a, a lead agency into tree lane. 
um, to have those case managers because um, you know how do we create a, a team approach to have more services like youth programming or mental health services beyond that case management um, so we're proactively trying to find out what those numbers is and what that budget is um, so that we can recruit those providers so what is the I know there's a transition in the case management you said you're looking at kind of a new approach yeah. Um, are, how are you going to put out RPs or to try and find people to fill those roles? Yep. So the, the city has proactively taken that step. The, the YWCA um, and Heartland have mutually decided that the Y will be pulling out. So they'll be um, leaving as of March 15th. Um, so we've known this for a couple of months where we have reached out to some of the service providers um, in the area to kind of see what the capacity is. Um, we have gotten um, the official pay from the road home. We'll offer interim services right now for up to six months. Um, we're confident in their ability. They'll pull some of their case managers um, to the site as we can take some of that time to write an RFP. Um, it will not be a long RFP process, <laughs> but to write an RFP be very clear what we are looking for for that permit service provider that housing stabilization team to come in and provide those ongoing services. And we hope that there's some overlap then that the road home can help us with that transition um, of ensuring a new provider coming in um, is adequately prepared. So there's something that I've always wondered about and I've been talking to Jim. Do, do you have a, some places in Milwaukee and yeah. were they open before the Madison locations? Yes. So Jim has always sort of talked about the that in Illinois there's a different way of funding model, but but that funding model doesn't exist in Milwaukee. The, well, some of those models do, but so the prim in Illinois, the primary way that. Um, not just us, other affordable housing developers fund services is, is through state funding. Okay. And so the Illinois Department of Human Services has uh, two line items in their budget which uh, go toward the services for supportive housing. And that's one of those key ways that we fund services in Illinois. So we don't have that here. So how do, how do you handle that in Milwaukee then? Uh, that's a great question. So. Uh, with some of our with some of our uh, buildings, it is um, uh, again local partners. So, for instance, County Mil uh, Milwaukee County um, does provide some service funding to us at uh, at several of our properties, um, and the other is fundraising, similar to what we just described, where we've had local partners who we've worked with on fundraising strategies, and we've been able to secure additional funds that way. Um, and so when you when you responded to our RFP, was that notion and history from Milwaukee included in the RFP responses that that Highland provided? Well, yeah. So I don't know that the RFP asked the question of how will we fund services. I don't even think. Uh, I don't believe there was even the, the questions of how you fund this development. It was, it was an RFQ, so it was qualifications. Mm -hmm. and so we talked about our experience um, and our qualifications to do this kind of work. You know, I think um, once we were selected, that's when the discussion started happening about, um, you know, with this kind of development, there are three sort of pots of money that you have to fill. Uh, the capital to build the building, um, rental subsidies to make it affordable um, and yet allow us to operate the building and then that service bucket, the service, uh, the funding for services and it was uh, then that we started working on all three of those um, in partnership with uh, the city, our partner and you know looking at opportunities um, for grants and that sort of thing. But I just want to clarify, so you, you knew there was a gap with Wisconsin and how your, your funding model worked in Illinois? I wouldn't necessarily call it a gap. I, I would say we well, knew we would have to fund those differently than what right. we fund. Okay. Uh, based, yeah. Right. Okay. 
I'm not going to have something. Um, I'm one of two people that are on this board that used to be homeless. Um, I know <laughs> my joy to the people at Left Key uh, because I, I used to hang with them. So, mm. but um, is there what kind of supportive services is over there right now? RFP Cares. Yep. Yeah. So there, um, there we partnered with um, one of our, let's call it our sister agency within Heartland Alliance, the parent company. And so they're called Heartland Alliance Health. Um, and they're, uh, they're uh, the uh, health care for the homeless provider in Chicago. So their, um, their services are about physical and mental health services, in fact, some dental services for homeless populations. That's what they do. They run clinics, they run, uh, they own some properties, and they provide services to people in their properties. But that's, that's the kind of work that they do, and we felt that would be a really strong partnership given this population here as well. Um, and so we've partnered with them, and they provide the services there. We have um, a licensed clinical social worker, uh, I don't know, Clint's, uh, we, have, we have three full-time employees that are based at the building that provide a range of services from, um, it's really, uh, the funding for that um, is called CCS, or I think it's Comprehensive Community Services. It's a Medicaid billing opportunity. And in fact, there's a couple ways that they're billing for Medicaid. And so it's a very much a health-based approach to case management and health management, um, health management interventions. But it's also about community engagement and socialization. And so we have events at the, at the building. Um, we do a lot of cooking. We have a commercial kitchen there, and we do a lot of cooking with our community or with our, our residents. Um, there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one work. Um, so uh, developing individual service plans with each of them about, again, what are their goals? What are they trying to attain? Uh, attain? Um, where would they like to be in three years? And so it's a lot of engagement on those kinds of um, on those kinds of issues. Um, we know that there's a fair amount of substance abuse and mental illness uh, at at Rescue Terrace in in the homeless population in general. And so they're working on a lot of that uh, those kinds of issues. Um, I know they do groups uh, group work at the building. Group therapy at the building. Oh, and the other part, so uh, one of the great advantages uh, for that, in the, in the design of that building was we were able to get, uh, working with the city, 24 um, uh, public, I'm sorry, 24 project-based rental subsidies for veterans. They're called VASH, uh, VASH vouchers. And so we're housing 24 veterans, and not only do they have access to the services that our partner provides, Heartland Alliance Health, but they have access to um, all the case management and services that the VA provides as well. Um, and so that's, that's mainly what we're doing at the rest of the years. Okay, and um, I know about substance abuse, <laughs> a lot of it. Um, but there's been a rumor flying around. I run into red key people all the time because we catch the same bus together. We're basically sick of um, the same stuff. And there's a rumor that the third floor of the building had bed bugs. Well, I so I can't say the third floor, but I can tell you the building has bed. The building does have uh, certain units have bed bugs. Okay. Absolutely. What are you trying to do about it? Yeah. So we do have a monthly extermination program at the um, building, and we also have um, at the building to um, deal directly with bed bugs um, a portable heater, where we take two the participants' um, unit, where we can heat and um, try to um, eradicate the bed bugs that way. In addition, we try to give them best practices as far as um, what to do to prevent the bed bugs from the very beginning. I tell people all the time, it doesn't matter. Um, um, any, any one of us can gain bed bugs, even where we buy our clothes at, because yeah. some places are simply are not monitored. And so just simple things like, you know, if you purchase your clothes, it doesn't hurt to just dry them before you wear them. Um, simple best practices. Don't take in use that. furniture. Right. So that's an easy way to transmit or bring in mm -hmm. uh, bed bugs to a building. You see, you know, you see a couch or a chair, bring it in, um, and that can have it, and you don't know it. And so, 
Um, that's an easy one that we yeah. try and avoid. And then one of the features that we do have at Rec, even if they do um, by chance bring some of those items in, we actually have a bed bug room where you can actually place your items in that room for a period of time. And that would help prevent um, the spread of bed bugs. Well, tell them what, so what's the, what do we do in the room? Tell them. Also, what we do is that we place your items in a room and we heat that room up to a certain temperature that it basically kills off the um, bed bugs. It's staying there, um, you know, maybe four or five hours, and then we can transport the person's belongings to their room. And that's just another way of preventing the spread of um, that insect. Probably the biggest thing is word of mouth, no word of mouth, telling management mm -hmm. that you think you may have them. Um, once we know, we can treat it and try and prevent the spread, but that spreading is what, uh, I mean, that's what we're trying to avoid. Okay. Um, do you have anything like uh, any or any means there at all? Um, I don't believe we have AAB. I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah. We do have that, and again, it's all voluntary if you want to attend. But I know they do. They also do a lot of group therapy and a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions as well. Okay. Thanks for answering my questions. Sure. Um. So has the city building inspector been to Rethke related to the bed bugs, or is there any code enforcement notice pending? No, we haven't had a, uh, I don't think it's at the level where it involves the city inspector. Once they inform us, we do the um, proper treatments um, to eradicate the problem, so um, no. But um, every year, I don't, and I can't be for certain if it's here in Madison, and as na the nature of the program with the vouchers, we do have inspectors come out to inspect the units, right. but not as a result of the inspectors. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell me about this portable heater? Mm -hmm. I've not heard of this, but it sounds neat. Yeah. Um, so, um, the portable heater is a treatment that all exterminators use. We thought it would be a cost saving um, for us if instead of using a third party vendor to do it, that we just simply purchase one and use it when we need to use it. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't use the exterminator, it's just that I didn't know that that's one of the methods that they use. And so instead of paying them, we just have it within us. And then you just simply um, bring the heater up. We cover up certain items um, because the, the temperature gets extremely hot. So we do cover up certain items in the unit just to protect those items. And we ask the um, tenants to hang out for maybe an hour or two so we can treat the unit, go back in and test it. If we have to treat it some more, we treat it some more, and then hopefully resolve the issue. So yeah, you probably know this, but so uh, they're very sensitive, or there's a certain temperature above which they can't live. And so the idea is you're heating up, you're, you're somewhat sealing that unit, heating it up above that temperature and so it's going to um, kill the bugs that are in that room um, and given that they're studio units it's it's I think pretty effective right. I mean one right. heater can heat up that room pretty easily and so um, wondering about resident organization and efforts maybe previous and more contemporary um, to um, work with the folks living in the building to get, um, I don't know, maybe more of a sense of community, uh, belonging, um, input into operations and things like that. I don't know if there any so um, we do have a tenant resident council a model within our um, Heartland housing portfolio. Um, it's still a work in progress, um, honestly, here in um, Madison. And one reason is that there is a close-knit community, and we just have, and people are of the mindset that if you're on this council, you're asked to snitch. And that's not really the purpose of the council. The purpose of the council is to simply work with management for activities or any concerns that uh, residents might have, and to be an active participant in making the uh, apartment dwelling your home. And so um, we do encourage um, the formation of tenant councils within our buildings. We're still working to that, um, to that that towards that goal here in Madison, but that is a priority at Heartland um, Housing portfolio-wide to have uh, resident councils throughout all our parks. 
in his like we, we are working on it in the fact of um, like tomorrow there's an event um, where outside um, program participants will be coming in to help like lead some conversations about placemaking and um, having the building feel more like a home and um, all those kinds of things. So um, we're, we're trying not to kind of, we've got an outpour of people who want to come and um, kind of support Tree Lane and help and we so appreciate that. We're trying not to overwhelm residents as well, we're bringing many different providers in. Um, but I'm seeing um, good progress of us kind of working with the Y to start bringing some individuals in to start helping us with that um, um, leadership skills also with some of the residents so we can um, move forward. Um, it was in the newspaper and um, I don't know, known to people that the mayor um, placed or positioned or asked uh, Deputy Mayor Gloria Reyes to be on site at Tree Lane. Um, can you explain what that means, how that, where she is, how often she's there, what she's doing, doing and what her relationship is with property management, residents, the mayor's office, other city agencies, the police department? Um, so yeah, so it was um, after November <coughs> there was an increase in calls of service over on the west side. So increase of calls of service for police at Tree Lane and the surrounding property um, that he thought was very important to have one of his staff kind of dedicated to that building as we kind of work through some of these issues. Um, so Gloria is there a few times a week. We have standing meetings now. Um, so every Wednesday there's a team of us. Um, that includes the Y and Heartland, um, the private security company, and uh, Mass and Police, as long as with the um, Community Development Division. Um, that we started meeting, we're, we're kind of called the safety team, um, to kind of talk about um, the calls for service and the safety of the building and the safety of the residents, and um, kind of some of the activity that's happening in the surrounding neighborhood as well. So the point of that team is to kind of um, um, hear from the police and hear from um, the security that's on site and hear from the why as well of concerns of the building and problem solve as we go forward of um, what can we do to make the property more um, you know, safe for residents um, and for staff and everyone. So did she like take someone's office or I'm just like so confused as to how this happens. So there's, a, so there's, there's two places that she sits there. Um, we actually do have um, an empty so the YWA staff, we have three social services office there. The Y only have two staff that are there full time um, and then their supervisor just kind of comes every once in a while so her office is empty and Gloria uses that office. Then I also find her um, in the conference room a lot as well. Um, one of the great things that she's been doing out there is she has been that open resource for residents to come down and talk to as well. Um, so sometimes the residents don't want to come and talk to property management or the Y about issues that they're seeing at the building, um, but they have been comfortable talking to Gloria. Um, and then not just the residents, but also um, the surrounding neighborhood. Um, we are trying to make a, an effort to make sure that there's communication um, with the neighborhood associations in the area and hear what their concerns are um, and build that bridge between the neighborhood and the residents of Tree Lane, because this is their neighborhood now as well. So um, Gloria has um, kind of organized a lot of those meetings and been present to um, kind of work through that. She's working with the Community Development Division of finding that next um, support service provider. Um, again, as a um, kind of contact, getting needs for us, who we can talk to about potential services. Um, and then she is reporting back to the mayor um, and to our internal staff team of things that are happening out there that need immediate response um, and, and trying to keep people up to date. I know we have someone, let me just check on, because sometimes we can have people ask questions from afar. And I'm not sure, I know the city, we could, city like the Ad Hoc Police Committee, we can make a motion to suspend the rules and allow for conversation between the committee and people sitting in the, in the gallery. I don't know if the county allows for that. I honestly don't know. 
the reality <laughs> is a member from the audience can pose a question that a member can reiterate. So okay. it's there is a technical way to get over any. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, as I understand it, the piece of property is, oh, my name is Aviva Kaiser. I am a resident of the Oak Bridge community. My understanding that that piece of property is 1.3 acres. And I guess my question is, putting a 45-unit building that has, at, well, at least we're told the last meeting, 102 children in it seems a little bit big for that piece of property. That's my first question. And then my, my second question is, it just seems odd to me, and I'm 65, I've been a lawyer since, for over 40 years, um, it seems odd to me that these issues weren't expected and planned for. So not only now does my neighborhood, and, and there was testimony at the one hearing, that our houses are not selling and our property values have declined, but now we're paying taxes, an increase in taxes, or my tax money is going to subsidize, um, you know, the the security and you know the services for the building. So, so the question, question is kind of two parts. So the first question is, what is there? Too, are there too many people for the size of the parcel? Right. The second question, I'm not sure we got it in the form of a question. <laughs> so. Which is, it's frustrating, and what's going to be done about it? There was 90 police calls in 90 days. It only takes three police calls in 90 days for it to be a public nuisance. Okay. So, so what? Would, so I guess. So, so what's, what's going to happen? Okay. So what's going to happen in terms of the security? in terms of security and services. I mean, I am a proponent of housing first, but it seems to me that you can't have a, no services, no plan for real services and have it work. So, so the first part of um, the, the acreage, so um, I'm not from our planning or zoning department, <laughs> so just saying that. Um, so the city did select the site um, and um, you know we are we have goals of building um, permanent supportive housing that also was big enough that through the number of units helped us with operating dollars. So there is about ninety thousand dollars from the operating that goes to pay for some of the support services. So there was this balance of um, making sure that there was the number of units that kind of um, offset some costs for those support services as well. Um, working with our planning department, um, the 45 units was zoned through them that it was acceptable. I think we definitely um, saw that there, there are issues in the fact that there's 104 kids and there's very limited space outside for those kids to play. Um, I think this is where um, you know, Community Development Division, when we were working with Heartland on the design, um, really started looking at those neighborhood facilities. There is a park less than a half a mile away that we would hope that the kids would um, use and interact with as well. I think this is one of those steps where um, we need to make sure that there's adequate um, kind of resources for the kids in the community, making sure that the kids at Tree Lane feel safe walking um, to that park and utilizing that park. Um, without, um, you know, kind of neighborhood having fear that their um, groups of kids are walking to that park. I think we are looking at how we can expand those services at Lucher and the Wisconsin Youth Company and other providers um, at after school programs um, at the, and, and that kind of stuff so the kids are not kind of just coming back to that building um, and not having resources for them. So. Um, Again, I can't speak for planning's um, decisions on the design of the building, um, but I can say as a programming piece, we have now opened that building. Um, we have now um, engaged with those kids and the residents. Um, we're hearing what those additional needs are to make sure that they have a good quality of life in that building, and we'll look at expanding um, services and um, one of the things that we're also um, hoping will come um, in this housing stabilization team 
um, is um, what I'm calling a, a youth coordinator or someone dedicated to um, kind of that programming for youth or that liaison between the youth and the schools. Because um, with two to four bedroom units, we're always going to have a lot of kids at that building. So having someone um, full-time staff that will help with that, I think will be beneficial. Um, there, there is capacity right now at after school programs. It's making that connection between kids and those programs and wanting them to engage. Um, that's, that's a big gap right now that we need to do um, help with going forward. Sorry, I already forgot the second part of the question. Oh, going forward, what, what we're doing about security. So, um, like I said, we, we have this safety team that has been meeting. Um, and looking at not just the safety concerns of the, of the building, but the safety concerns of that surrounding neighborhood. Um, I think when we um, have um, our kind of new support service provider um, who will be fully staffed, unfortunately the Y is not fully staffed right now. So um, they have the two case managers there that they are dealing with a lot of crisis stabilization right now. Um, and so kind of that long-term um, planning and housing stabilization and um, kind of moving on to those next goals. Um, and I think, um, you know, having that full team is going to be helpful. As Candace kind of said earlier, it is, um, it's not just also about the residents, it's about the guests coming in. So as we are um, kind of stabilizing the guests and um, getting them to um, kind of understand um, those kind of um, ways to not have those people kind of come into the building and prey on them. Um, we're hoping that also kind of helps with the surrounding community because um, some of that is that guest behavior. Um, so with Tree or with Refki, you're working with your partner, a sister organization, um, and with Tree Lane, you had, they were part of your proposal to do this work, the why. Um, I'm wondering with the next phase where we have a housing stabilization team, um, and well, maybe the road home on an interim and working towards this team model that provides a greater array of service options. Um, do you see like yourself as property managers on the same team with the supportive services and how do you cultivate that relationship um working relationship going forward did you learn was there anything to be learned from what what's been going on with the why and i understand there's a a shortage of staffing and that is a problem in and of itself but um, how does this you know evolve and how does the a, a new relationship with maybe multiple agencies um, really work to stabilize the the residents and kind of create long-term success yeah. Should we kind of talk about yeah. the sort of housing yeah, I'll start. Yeah, I'll start first. Um, <coughs> one uh, lessons learned. You know, uh, when we start uh, engaging with our participants, getting them ready to be housed, we look we look at it from a property management lens because of the funding source that we receive. We have to start off 120 days in advance of a move in, just getting them ready to move in from a a lender or regulatory perspective. Um, in retrospect, the same effort that went into making sure that a person is qualified um, from that part of the operations, should all, that exact same effort should go into the services, right, before a person ever moves into our um, property. Because we're engaging that participant um, 120 days in advance from a property management standpoint, we should also be really engaging um, that uh, participant um, that same amount of time from uh, a supportive housing standpoint. Um, our um, 
model is as such is that we all work together as a team. And so it's three tiers to our team. It's the, uh, the resident, the property manager, and the supportive service case manager. And wh whatever goes on at that property, it should be handled by those three um, entities together as a whole. And that's the only way really supportive housing um, will work, you know, um, with the residents singing property management and services as one. I often tell a story when I worked in property management, I worked at Chicago Public Housing Authority and my case manager was Batman and I was Robin. We did everything together, even with the creation of our tenant selection plan. Because I'm looking at it from one lens and she's looking at it from another lens. And we have to educate each other to make the um, the model work. And so um, in retrospect, if we had to, you know, redo some of the things that we've done over again, we have to market the services that is a benefit to our participants and really um, help them understand um, the why and what we're doing and the benefits of um, having these services to them. Um, I knew all of our resident at, residents at our Tree Lane very well before they moved in because I was working with them from a property management standpoint. We were talking on a regular basis. We have to afford our service providers the same opportunity in future developments. And then that way, services won't look like it's um, mandatory or just something extra. It's something that they will, will want to engage in from the onset. You know, I would say another lesson learned for us that we would apply going forward is, so you kind of hit on it. So when we partner with our sister agencies, we have years and years and years of history working together, and we know our philosophies align uh, at a very detailed level. And I think we would have put in a little bit more of that time early to just make sure we were on the same page on all those details with the why. Um, yeah, and we would do that with new providers just to make sure uh, we are on the same page in all aspects of how we're going to work together and collaboratively. And I think that'll lead to some good outcomes as well. Um, I just want to say that I think, well, I'll speak for myself as a county supervisor on this um, committee that um, I really want to see you succeed and I, I want there to be more permanent support of housing projects of different shapes and sizes um, throughout the city of Madison, throughout Dane County, throughout the region. So. Um, thank you for doing this. I know it's hard, okay? And, um, and, and you, you know, I hope we can get more, more funding um, so it can be adequately staffed and I hope we can help support both the residents and the providers and the partner agencies in the community to, to show and really demonstrate how this should be done and why housing is a solution to homelessness. Um, so it, it warms my heart when you talk about being a human rights organization and say that you're in the business of doing human rights work um, because that is absolutely right on. And I think this committee has spent a lot of time thinking about what it means as someone you know, who hasn't had housing to have dignity and, and human rights um, honored and respected. Um, I guess I'm would like to hear a little bit before you go um, what, how that philosophy with, of harm reduction, of housing first, um, I get and I kind of know what it means on the service side of things, but I'm wondering how that meshes with the property management <laughs> side of things. Um, can you explain that? And, and is and anything different or is the property management side of things just kind of like any property management side of Okay, um, that's an excellent question. And so, um, and to be honest with you, that was a question I first asked when I started working in Hartland. Um, um, how does that, how does harm reduction fit in the lens of a property manager? And so I came away with a couple of takeaways when I um, did um, ask that question. And one was that, um, the biggest thing that we try to convey, or I try to convey to our residents, is that you have to have open communication, you know, uh, whether it's through a resident council or through the YWCA, because I can help you 
when the problem is small. I can help you when you're only one month behind in your rent versus five months because in reality, you're not going to be able to catch up and I'm not going to be able to operate the building uh, with you being that far behind. So from a harm reduction approach, you know, when you're one month behind in your rent, you come talk to me, okay? Because I can, we can fix one month a lot easier than we can fix five months, you know. Um, uh, from a from a property management standpoint, you know, you have, um, I tell my participants, you have rights as a participant in this building, but you also have responsibility. So when things are arising to a level of conflict, and I really um, have an open door policy when I talk to them, make them comfortable enough to say, you can come in here, let's create this safe space so we can work out whatever issue that you have before it rise to a level of a police call or rise to a level of a serious violation when ultimately now my hands is tied as a property manager and I have to go through the court system to resolve an issue. Eviction should be the very last resort in our business. And I give the same speech to every property manager that I interviewed with Hartman. If you think the first month that you're going to evict someone to resolve a conflict, then this is not the place for you to work because we're going to almost always say no. We're going to deny you the uh, right to go forth with an eviction. And so if we get to the point that we're at court, that means we have exhausted all measures, whether it's um, meeting with the case manager, helping with the service plan, um, um, giving you payment agreements two and three times over, and even going to the point of saying, you know what, I still don't want an eviction on your record. Can we mutually terminate your lease? And if you tell me you need 45 days to um, vacate the premises, then I'm gonna grant you those 45 days. And so if it, got, if it has gotten to the point where we're actually in court, that's because we have exhausted all of those measures. We have um, um, provided several options and now safety and security is the top priority, not only for the community, but actually sometimes for that actual participant that we have to take to court. And so it is absolutely the very last resort in our world to actually go before the judge. One, because honestly, I don't want to pay the money for a lawyer, you know, when we can work this out too. We know going in the door that um, this work is hard, you know, and that we have to um, look at it from a harm reduction lens, uh, a conflict resolution lens, in order to get things resolved. Because we know um, going into the door that our um, participants have um, serious issues that actually won't be resolved with the court action, you know. And we want to work on um, getting to the root cause to prevent um, um, a reoccurrence of homelessness. Can you I just want to point out one thing that the county is also giving some more funding, I believe, for or has in 2019 for refugees. Refugee. And no, I, I thought yeah. also, no, there was something being considered for tree lane, and that's the not. county. Does that. So, right now, the um, funding for tree lane is um, 90000 from Heartland to cover 50000 from the city of Madison and 25000 from United Way. So um, what was on the HHN agenda? That was not anything. Okay. Hmm. Good luck, more money. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, let me know. <laughs> Did Brenda have a question? I, I do. Um, I hear what you're saying, yeah. and then I know what happens in reality, and it isn't matching. It feels like a complete disconnect to me. And I think I'm... I've seen people get evicted from Rusky, probably more than Tree Lane. Because um, I used to work at the Tenant Resource Center and we were at court when those evictions were happening. And, you know, we saw the five day notices as they were coming through. And I also was in the Homeless Services Consortium where, you know, the theory is, is that if somebody's about to get evicted, we want to prevent <laughs> them from going back into the Homeless Services system. <laughs> and we want to make sure that they land somewhere. I haven't seen that happen at all. 
not just with you guys, but with any landlord, to tell you the truth. But I'm, I'm just curious, like I, I hear you saying you're working on things or you're trying to help people make sure they don't get to that point where they're getting evicted, but I, that's not what I've seen. And I'm, I'm just curious, like, do you have ideas about how it might be different in the future? Because it seems like, um, you know, people being evicted for non-payment of rent isn't supposed to be happening in Housing First. Um, and there were several of those when you guys first opened up, Rusky. Um, and, you know, and so it, it seems like there's just a disconnect between reality and what I hear you saying. Yes. So I, I can take this to start, just a little bit of explaining the process of, um, so when any of our property managers at our permit supportive housing, um, the Homeless Services Consortium has this set of called, called written standards. And we ask all of them um, that receive city funds or COC funds, um, and including Heartland, um, to follow these written standards. So the goal is, before property management is going to issue that five day, they take them to what we call housing placement team, um, where we talk about transfers. So the philosophy around Housing First is we know that sometimes people are going to not be successful at a current um, housing place. Like, they, they're not going to connect with that case manager. Um, they um, aren't connecting with that property manager. They're just never going to be successful there. So the idea is um, then you move them to someplace else. Um, we've learned that people need to move sometimes up to three times before it finally kind of clicks, like, okay, I'm about to lose my housing. I, I need to um, kind of work on things. We have a huge shortage of supply here in the county. And um, as someone who used to run the housing placement meetings, I can tell you it's very frustrating when um, you kind of bring up someone that says they are not working out in this, in this program. We need to move them someplace else and every other place is full. Um, so that is, to, to Heidi's point of um, increasing that permit support of housing in the future of um, what we're doing, we are not gonna be successful in housing first unless we create more units that are that have the support services and that are affordable for individuals. Um, so I, I know that um, you know when we first opened up Rethke, um, again, a lot of lessons learned. Um, some individuals, we were also just creating that housing placement team as well. So it was kind of a perfect storm of people sometimes not coming to the appropriate meetings. Um, we now have a coordinated entry manager. That is, their responsibility is to manage those meetings and manage that kind of transfer system. I think as we create a more robust homeless services consortium, some of those issues are going to be resolved. Um, but we needed all the right people in place and not people who do 15 different jobs um, out of the goodness of their heart to make sure that that was happening. Um, so we are working closely with Heartland as well to ensure that they understand our local COC and what we expect out of them, that they are following all of those um, policies and procedures. Yeah, I would just add, so uh, lesson learned on our part, we, we have changed our approach or we've benefited from understanding more how to work with the placement team. And so I do think that's improved and will continue to evolve and improve as we go forward as well. I, so <clears throat> do you have the eviction <clears throat> data for Tree Lane and Rethke? I mean, you, sound, you, you make a, a good story about what we do to prevent it. I'm hearing potentially there is some individuals that have been, exp I, I'm sorry, I work in school, so I call them expelled, but um, uh, evicted, what, what is the actual data? So I don't have a data uh, with me on refugee terrorists right now. I can tell you that we have engaged um, seven individuals at Tree Lane, um, seven, um, families. seven families at Tree Lane with, um, through the eviction process. Two, we were able to resolve um, and there's still tenants at the building. We were able to resolve that with, simply by working with the YWCA and um, um, finding resources for them to stay uh, within the building. Two, even though we terminated uh, tenancy, we did it without doing an eviction on their record. So they don't actually have uh, an eviction on their record, although they're not uh, residents at Tree Lane. And, um, we um, um, went to court and was not successful, and so we're working with um, those participants 
to, um, again, transfer them through, um, um, through the voucher system, giving them portable vouchers to get um, to receive housing elsewhere. And um, one, we're still going through the process. And so um, even though we've engaged um, the court action, um, we've only had one that actually resulted in an actual eviction on their record. The other ones, um, um, we're either working with them still, it's still work in progress, or people decided, we agreed that they would move out and they moved out without actually getting an eviction on their record. So, so what does it mean when you say you went to court and it was not successful? The judge ruled against us. It was okay, so, so, so this, the, individual, the individual family, at least, or gets to stay? They're still residing there, yes. Okay, and then what are their obligations and what are your obligations? I guess I, I've never heard of this, so I'm just... Okay. So our obligations are still, they're, they're our tenants. They have the same rights um, and responsibilities as every other um, participant there. Um, you know, um, sometimes you win in court, sometimes you don't. It doesn't change how we provide services to that um, participant. Um, if anything, I've seen participants who've gone through that um, proceeding, you know, engage more in services. And so, um, they're just our tenants, and we right. just resume business as usual in cases like that. Okay. And so is the is the slate wiped clean? Are there previous issues still move carried forward? I mean, I mean, if someone doesn't, if someone owes you money, you know, or 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 has two strikes or whatever, <laughs> do they? I don't know. No, I don't any think it's a. Um, three strikes you out type of policy. Sure. I just think it's just we simply try to engage um, that participant um, and help them where they may need some assistance and still just still um, provide them the services that they need. You know, it's, um, for lack of a better word, it's no retaliation because um, I lost and you won this time. In fact, we all won because you're still housed and we have another opportunity to just do it over again and hopefully um, not end up in the same place that we were before. Any other questions? I just have one clarifying question. Okay, one clarifying question. Um, you had said the social services budget, so the budget for services, is um, the $90,000 from the operating um, excess um, the city provides fifty thousand dollars in United Way, twenty five thousand, and that's a total. That is a sum total for, for services for, of services right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be a second um, resolution besides the security one that you guys referenced before that will increase um, the city's portion of by the some amount, of, by some amount. Um, Then we are also um, talking with United Way um, and the county as well. Um, the county budget process is a little bit different than ours, um, so <coughs> mostly we're talking to United Way about a potential increases in their funding as well. Because um, this is a partner project; it's not just a city of Madison project. Like um, you know, the county um, provided the funds um, for the capital for the building to be built. Um, the county actually owns the land to the, to the building. Um, you know, we. Throughout this whole process of planning, um, you know, we were engaged with all of our funders to um, try to make sure that we um, learned our lessons from Rocky and that we had adequate funding for the services on day one. Lots of moving pieces through this process. Um, you know, it takes us about um, over a year to um, actually, you know, from shovel to um, getting the doors open. Um, some, it's, it's, it's not just about the budget process through the city, United Way, it's about um, contributions. If those contributions don't come in as high as they expect, um, programs um, have to get adjusted. So um, definitely a, a learning process of what we think that the budget is going to be, um, and then making sure we um, have all of those parts when the doors open. Just to, so Heartland Housing is also doing our own fundraising efforts. So we're contacting quite a few foundations and family foundations, uh, corporate uh, corporate foundations and philanthropy, uh, trying to increase the amount of uh, dollars for services as well. 
So I know this is a tax credit project. Do you not have to have those service dollars in place before as part of the application? We did. So okay, so you had the, the funding from the city and the funding from and the operate. So that was stated in the application. Right. Mm -hmm. And so basically what you're finding now is that that wasn't sufficient. Correct. Um, yeah, Mr. Support directed at Harper. And so I mean I think there's a few pieces here. I'm Robin Serino, community member. Um, and I'm happy that you guys are here, I have to say, and that these housing first developments have moved forward. Um, I think there's some and I'm curious what your takes are on it as far as kind of lessons learned. <clears throat> that there's several pieces that feel like as a community member and kind of hearing from folks that live because I don't live in that community, um, so I don't experience those pieces. But there's some historical cultural pieces, I think, that seem very different, apples to oranges, from Milwaukee, Chicago, and Madison, and I'm curious about. Um, and one of the biggest ones is the distrust of landlords and the terrible process here of what happens to individuals that have any kind of legal action on them regarding you know their trust of you being able to come to you even when they're one month behind as opposed to working with you and how that's been taken into consideration or if that's even on your radar as well as the pieces of just kind of general community building which didn't happen it looks like at all on the outside as far as you know whether that was staggered move-ins of five families at a time with neighborhood activities happening in I mean to me it really doesn't seem like a big surprise that there's not a lot of buy-in either from the existing residents or the new residents that were moved in, and how you see kind of that you know, repair process happening, or if you even consider that that's an important piece of this, you know, to get the residents that are living there actually engaged and to trust you, why should they come to the table when everything's taken out of their hands right now? Mm -hmm. interesting. Do you want to address the first one? I can do it. <coughs> I've learned through my experiences in <coughs> working in property management that the only way you're going to get residents to trust you is through your actions, you know. And so that takes a lot of engaging, a lot of um, talking, and a lot of explaining why you do what you do. <coughs> if you have time to do that, um, um, then the relationships will develop over time. One of the lessons learned is that um, um, I mean, it was just the perfect storm to be um, transparent, you know. The building was delivered late to us. We had obligations to all the partners. And so um, the time that you would spend developing that relationship, we didn't get that time with tree um, like we did to a certain degree with the Bradley. Um We moved in 45 families and um, their children, I think, in the span of two weeks. You know, there's a delay. The yeah. delay or not the delay. The uh, the issue of how long they could stay in shelter right. driving some of that as well. Yeah, <coughs> and, and that was a, that was a huge concern too because um, we were getting calls on a regular basis saying that my time is about to expire from the shelter that I was in, and so we had to take all of that into consideration. Our biggest concern, honestly, was saying that you know what, if we could get them house, you know under this one roof, those relationships will come all the time. That was a, a lesson one, you know. Um, if we had to do it over again, I would prefer five at a time, you know, or maybe 10 at a time, you know. And then that way, um, they can get to know me, and I can get to know them, and they can get to know our staff, and then from the <coughs> onset, um, um, develop some of those relationships. The other thing that I would say, too, is that, and I had to learn this from our case um, manager, um, one of our partners in Chicago, actually Hartland Alliance Health, is that um, we have to be conscious always of what our participants or our families have gone through that prevent them from trusting you in the very beginning, you know. And so we need to look at things um, from their from their rooms versus, you know, okay, I'm the landlord, you're the tenant. <coughs> and so that's a huge lesson line, you know. Um, regardless of the person is, you know, they had to just, we're still developing that relationship because of some of the experiences that they've been through. And they're just learning now that, you know, um, if I say, if we say we're going to do something, we're going to do it, but we have to. There was a proven period, you know, and I think we're still in that proven period where they're trying to 
say, you know what, probably said they're going to do this, and yes, they're doing this. And so it's just, it's just work in progress. And uh, I thought your comment about community development and community engagement was spot on. I would say that too, lesson learned. Uh, we with the YWCA should have been doing uh, more of that engagement before we opened. Um, uh, institutions, uh, with the library who's now providing great services with our families, with the Madison Police more engagement, with the Lucher Center, and just with our neighbors, and and so I think that would have eased the transition quite a bit uh, for our neighbors, for our residents, for us as well. And you know that's a lesson learned. We can do better there. And I would say that that is a lot of the effort that we've been making recently, and we'll continue to do to make those connections uh, for ourselves and for our residents, so that we establish those and um, you know we're part of the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean I'm curious again, kind of those are like cultural pieces here in Madison that are very different. I mean, kind of that piece around, one, just the rental piece, the trust. I mean, you just had seven evictions out there. I mean, talk about a lot of, you know, re-traumatization and broken trust again, as well as the majority of the community that have experienced homelessness, their experience with our police department here isn't great. So when you say you're gonna invest another, you know, or we're coming on board to put another $160,000 into security, it's not their security from the framework, from, you know, the lens that your residents have. And I think those are important pieces that if you're gonna build community, truly build community and bring the residents in that project together with the residents outside of that project. It's, a, it's an uphill. And I just think those are important pieces that have to be taken into consideration. And, and I'm super happy you're here. And it's a massive job. So thank you for undertaking it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us.